The following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. This morning, God's got a great message for us, but I want to be clear about something. It's not a popular message, but it is a powerful message. So if you came for an unpopular message and a powerful one, you're in the right place. Um, It's a hard message, but it's a liberating message at the same time. We've been going through this series called Facing the Giants, and we're literally looking at the biggest giants or hindrances in the life of a believer that set us back from living for the fullness of God's glory, for getting in on the calling God has for each of us. God's got a hope and a future and a calling for everyone, and yet there are things that hinder or set back uh, our lives as Christians. And the topics we've picked, I've consulted with other pastors and leaders and asked them as well after praying about what are the biggest obstacles that set us back, that seem to hold back our lives as, as believers. And we've been going through a series of these different things. We've talked about fear. We've talked about doubt. We've talked about unforgiveness. Uh, we looked at our past And we looked at desire, the giant of desire last week. And it's interesting, when you look at certain giants, so to speak, we realize some giants don't travel alone. When we looked at the giant of unforgiveness, for example, in our lives, if unforgiveness exists in our lives, we said it doesn't travel alone, it travels with bitterness and resentment. Those two travel right along with it. Well, when we look at the giant of desire, there's another giant behind it. And it's the giant of self, because all desire comes from inside here. They're all the desires of our own heart. It's really a reflection of who we are, or should I say, whose we are. The gospel's got a profound presentation, and I believe it's the most important key to God's kingdom. And it really comes down to who we are. It really comes down to an issue of identity, And this passage really lays it right right open this morning. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 8. If you have your Bibles there, you can open up. It really breaks down identity, not just who we are, but whose we are. And whose we are determines everything. It's really a driver of everything. And if, if we get this aspect of identity down, we don't have to keep dealing with the giant of desire and the giant of self for the rest of our life. We, we kind of get to reckon with it uh, in a definitive way. Yeah, there's struggles in life, and there always will be, but at least there will be a day where a decision was made, and we've chosen victory over this. So as we look at the giant of self, um, it's going to be pretty insightful. Hopefully, we can deal with some of these things. Um, quick story, a few years back, a friend of mine, good friend of mine, uh, who introduced me to ministry. When I was a, a newer believer, um, he was... Uh, you know, serving God all over the place, and he took me down to Skid Row to feed the homeless, and he did this regularly, so I started doing this for a couple of few years, going down with this guy, and he was just on fire for God, and he loved God, and God used him powerfully, and then he decided to go over to India, and in India, he wanted to serve the lowest of the low, so he went to a class of people that they call the untouchables. Anybody ever heard of the untouchables? In India, they have a caste system. God didn't make up the system. People made up the system. But in this caste system, the untouchables are as low as you can go. And these people believe that you were born this way. You will always stay this way. You will never leave this class of people. And this is basically God's curse on you. This is where you belong. So these people live in the outskirts of town. They basically get their food from the dump. And they live on the hill right next to the garbage dump. And this is so my friend said, I'm going to go out and live with these people for a couple of years and just minister to them and remind them of their God-given identity because issues of identity and issues of self, uh, the giant of self had them conquered in a different way, believing they had no value. And so he went out to minister to these people. And since they're Hindus and they believe in thousands of gods, thousands of gods, There was all sorts of spiritual warfare going on over there, as you can imagine. He told me one story one night. He was staying in the tents because they had these little tents on the side of this hill. And some other group, kind of like a tribe, came in with machetes one night uh, to attack this other uh, village where they were in. And he was scared to death. All of a sudden, a panic in the middle of the night. 
But you have to realize a lot of these uh, Hindu people from India, they're about you know, somewhere around this tall. And my friend uh, is blonde and blue-eyed. He's about this tall. And they never saw anybody like him in their life, many of them. So as they came in in the middle of the night, he came out of their tent like, what's going on? And they looked at him and dropped machetes and ran. Um, it was, <laughs> they thought they saw an angel. Really cool stuff. But after a couple of years over there of giving life and imparting to these people identity and, and their God-given identity and how God sees them, uh, helping them understand what self really is about, and, and this is not where you belong. God's calling you to a different place. He sends the Lord tell him loud and clear before he left there that although you've dealt with some giants over here, there's a much bigger one you're going to deal with when you get back home to America, a much bigger one than all of this warfare. And he sends the Lord tell him it's the giant of self. Dealing with self back home in America is going to be a way bigger battle than all this stuff you dealt with over here. And I remember when he told me that, I kind of hung on to that for a while. And, and as time goes on, I go, you know, you're right. Dealing with self or the giant of self or how self tries to rise up in our lives uh, will hinder us from everything that God has for us. Much like these untouchables were suppressed by their view of self, sometimes we, we can project and run after and chase things that are such a contradiction to God's calling. And we said last week when we talked about desire, we're not talking about not having nice things. Nice things are great. This isn't a, a call to poverty. Many uh, wealthy, blessed people in the Bible, you look at Solomon, you look at Joseph of Arimathea, you look at Abraham, God doesn't have an issue with wealth. It's where the wealth is that matters. It's not money, it's where money is. I want to be really clear, this is not a statement on that. But what it is a statement on what drives us and what compels us and our desires are driven by self. How we see ourselves, what we think we want compels everything. And so as we look at this story um, this morning in Mark chapter 8, Jesus gives an enormous key to the kingdom of God. And he says, if you want to know what it's about, and he starts to tell us what it's about, he says it really begins with self. You want to know how to get into the kingdom? You want to know what the kingdom is about? You want to know what life is about? You want to know what the future and the hope is about? It starts with self, and he is saying it starts with denying ourself. Interesting. Let's look in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 34. It says this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his Father's glory with his holy angels." He starts this out to break this down, to see this in the right light. He starts out speaking, and it says in the beginning, it's not just to the apostles. He's talking to the whole crowd, apostles, everyone. Everyone who wants to follow me, everyone who says they believe in me, everyone who says they want to walk with me, this is for everyone. I say that because some might think, well, that's, that's for the apostles. That's not for me. It's for everyone. This is for me. This is for you. This is everyone who says yes to Jesus that wants to turn and follow him. Here is some of the criteria. Jesus is saying this is where it starts. Now, these are tough words, and I know they're tough words, and that's why this is not a popular message, but it is incredibly powerful. These are the kind of statements Jesus made that everyone was following him and loving the multiplying the bread, the sushi and the pita bread up on the hill, you know, croissants for free. Everyone's digging that. They're like, this is great, you know, following him everywhere. And then all of a sudden he would drop the bomb, something like this. And they'd go, whoa, whoa, what's up with that? I don't know. I'm telling you guys, this is a key to the kingdom of God. And I think we have to say things like this because I think the problem in Christianity today is a kind of a half baked version of what the kingdom is about and it doesn't only it doesn't always include this radical part of the message of Jesus Christ which is the transforming component does that make sense 
You, you can't have a full gospel without this. In fact, this is right smack in the middle of the good news, and so it's important. So he tells the whole crowd, he goes, this is where it starts. A couple of profound statements. You have to deny yourself, and you have to lose your life. Wow. That's a hard pill to swallow. Because nothing in ourself wants to deny ourselves. It's not natural to do that. And we don't want to lose our life. We don't even really want to know what that means. We'd rather walk around that one or, or skip that one. And the paradox is this. The world around us and everything on TV tells us the exact opposite. Everything we watch on TV tells us the opposite. The, you're not going to see commercials or a movie that are going to say, hey, deny yourself. Hey, lose your life. That's not popular. Give me the remote. I'm changing that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to hear that. We don't want to be reminded, but Jesus is like, look, I know you guys are following me, but I got to tell you, this is the key to the kingdom of God. It's denying yourself. It's losing your life. And he says that if you try to save it, you'll lose it. But if you lose it, you'll obtain it. He's talking about the abundant life. Um, the abundant life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have life abundantly, life to the fullest. In other words, Jesus is saying, I didn't just come for you to have heaven. Yes, I did. But that's part of it. I came that you can have a full life in the Holy Spirit here and now. And I want to tell you, all these apostles and the people in the early church that followed Jesus understood this really well. They, they understood the deny yourself, lose your life thing. That was 101 for them. In, in, in Christianity in America, it's not 101. Sometimes it doesn't come up. Again, it's not really popular, but it's so powerful. All the people we read stories about in the early church that were praying for the sick and radical things happen and changing cities, all those people, they knew what this is about because you can't have the power without this. Does that make sense? It's that big of a deal. He's talking about denying yourself and losing your life. And Jesus said, if we look at his statements, he says things like this so we can tie it together. He says, look, you can't even inherit the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Born again. Everyone say born again. again. That's a born again. How many of you heard odd statements tied to being born again? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, some are like, you know, yeah, believers, they're cool, but those born againers. (laughs) Have you heard that? You know, Christians are cool, but those born againers, like they're a different category, you know. That's the category Jesus put them in, the born againers. Now, I don't know what experience you have, but that is the kingdom. Jesus said there is no kingdom outside of born again. It's not like, well, you got these kind of believers and then you got the born againers. No, born again is straight up the kingdom of God. Born again, in other words, what Jesus is saying, it's new life in the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is implying you're born again after you. You're born again after you. You've got to die first. You see that, guys? You can't be born again unless we die. But no one's talking about dying because dying isn't popular. Dying's not fun. Dying sounds lame. But can I tell you something? There is profound life and liberty on the other side of dying. No one wants to talk about dying. But if we talk about dying in the sense of the kingdom of God, there is life and liberation on the other side in a powerful, powerful way way. Uh, It's new life in the Holy Spirit, and that life only comes after dying. Jesus goes on in this passage, and he says, look, deny yourself, lose your life, and pick up your cross. Now, I want to talk about your cross for a minute, because many times this gets misunderstood. Many times people think your cross means uh, the burdens and and the weight that you have to carry in life. Uh, you know, we have five children, and our, our little guy, Micah, he's not walking yet. He's got, you know, uh, special needs, and, you know, some will say, well, that's your cross to bear. That's your, your cross to carry, and that is a heavy load in our lives, and we pray for him, and we fight for him, and we, we cry out to God for him, and we serve him all the time, but that is not what this is talking about, a cross to bear. This is completely different. When we talk about struggles and burdens, everyone has those whether they're in the church or outside the church, whether they're a believer or not, life has struggles. There's tribulation in life. That's a reality for everyone on the planet. That's not what this is talking about. Jesus is talking about something else. A cross is a place where death happens. That's what a cross is. A cross is a place 
where people die. And everyone in first century Israel understood that. The Romans put them all over the place. It wasn't just Jesus and the two other guys on the cross. It was like, no, all over the Roman Empire, you're traveling around. You see crosses there all the time. The Roman Empire would use them as a form of capital punishment, and it would be an intimidation saying, this can happen to you too. So when Jesus is walking around and his apostles are seeing crosses all over the place, he's going, guys, pick up your cross. They're like, whoa, <laughs> what do you mean pick up your cross? Jesus is implying a a profound reality. He's implying that someone's got to die first. And he doesn't say just pick up a cross. He says pick up your cross. And this implies, church, that you already died. This implies that we already died first. Now, this is a pretty profound statement. And again, when you... When, when, you, when you hear about the kingdom of God, when you hear about faith, when you hear about Christianity, we don't always talk about this. I will admit it is not popular. This is not popular, but it is so powerful. And this is, I believe, is such a key element to the church understanding who we are, understanding identity, not only conquering the giant of desire and self, but being in the perfect position, poised for an outpouring of God's spirit to be used for his glory in a profound and incredibly powerful way is right here. Here is the key to the kingdom. He is saying, pick up your cross, implying that you've already died. I have a question for you this morning. Have you? Have you? I mean, have you already died? I know we're here because we believe. We like God. I mean, we wouldn't gather in his name if we didn't like him. We want to honor him. We, we, we read his word. We grow together. We worship him. That's, all, that's great. That's fantastic. But the bigger question is, have you died? And because I think what we see in Christianity in America is a presentation of the gospel where you just kind of add Jesus to your life and ask him to bless your stuff and say you believe, but no one ever dies. Does that make sense? Guys, if we don't die... We're missing the whole point. We're missing the power. We're missing everything about it because you've got to die to live. That's the reality. You've got to die to be a citizen. You've got to die to be a son, to be a daughter. You've got to die first. And this is implying that you've got to die first. I remember uh, right before I was going to get baptized, I'd been a believer for about maybe six months, and I'm, I'm like, okay, Lord, tomorrow's the baptism day, and I was praying, and, and I, I said, Lord, you know, I already gave you my life. You know that. I've already, you know, died to myself, and, you know, I'm yours. And I sensed the Lord loud and clear in a time of prayer the night before my baptism saying, did you? And I was shocked. Did I? Of course I did. And I sensed the Lord say, when? Well, you know, I, I, I like you, I love you, I, fo- I try to follow you. When? I, I don't know, just generally, you know, generally. <laughs> we, don't, <laughs> we don't generally die. To, to die like this is a day of a, it's a day that we die. It's a day, it's, 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 it's not a self-inflicted pain. Don't get this wrong. This is not some masochistic, painful, taking on this. No, that, that is not dying. God has done that, that. He's got a hope and a future for you. His plans are good. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're not to harm you, to prosper you and give you a hope and a future. That's the kind of life that's on the other side of this kind of death. But this kind of death is one where you say, as of now, I am not my own. I was bought with a price. Not just, yes, I believe you did that thing on the cross back then, so I'm good now, right? We're good, God? I got heaven and I get the blessings, right? Because I believe that. No, it's bigger than that. I am not my own. I was bought with a price. And now the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave. Do you see the difference in that? And that's why I think in that final day, Jesus goes, many are going to say, Lord, Lord. And they're going to go, what? Didn't I like, I went to church. I worship. What What are you talking about? And he's like, no, you're saying, Lord, I didn't know you that way. You knew me as a savior. You knew me as the son of God who came, but was I the Lord? And this is where it comes in, guys. Again, not a popular message, but a profoundly powerful one because it is a key to the kingdom of God. Picking up your cross is a place where your death already occurred. Do you believe or did you die? I certainly hope we all believe, but my prayer today 
is that we all die. Does that make sense? And not in a bad way, in a liberating, in a profound way. Um, if you're a note taker this morning, the first point is God is calling me to die to self. God is calling me to die to myself. That is where the battle begins. See, this giant of self doesn't uh, try to conquer from the outside, conquers from the inside, because it all be- be- uh, begins right inside of us. God is calling me to die to myself. And so we could either live for ourselves or, or we can live for Christ, but the reality is we can't really do both. And here is, here is the, the reality as well, that when we try to live for ourselves and try to honor God and follow him, but really live for ourselves, when we're living this dual nature, this dual life, the reality is it's a painful and frustrating way to go through life. Here's why. You're too much of a believer to enjoy the world for too long, and that gets frustrating, but you're too in the world to enjoy the kingdom and get in on the power of the kingdom. Does that make sense? And so you're, it, it's kind of one foot in and one foot out. And I think I want to pursue what the world has. But God, I want your blessings. And this is kind of how we try to navigate it. And the reality is we can't actually do both. We can't live for ourselves and live for Christ at the same time. And that struggle is a very real struggle that we have as believers that when we see something in the world and desires and we start to pursue it without pursuing God, this is where this contradiction in our own life happens. It's frustrating because it can't be done. That's why it's so frustrating because we really can't pursue everything the world has to offer and everything God has to offer at the same time. We can't really do that yet. When we pursue the kingdom of God and we give God everything, when we come under his lordship, when we die to ourselves and follow him, that is where life and liberty and peace and joy and his provision, all of that are. And it's a beautiful way to live life. The Bible says that we try to do both at the same time. It uses a term called double-minded or double-souled, which is interesting. And I say that because, again, some of the things that have come out lately, there's been some statistics that have come out. Some of you guys have heard of the Barna, Barna Research. Barna does statistics on Christianity and people of faith and um, and they came up with a statistic. Here's just one example of what I'm talking about. They came up with an exist, uh, a statistic saying that the percentage of uh, born-again Christians have the same divorce rate as the world has. Have you guys heard that statistic? How many of you guys have heard that statistic? Okay, basically the same rate. That's a statistic that's been floating around there. Everyone hears it. Everyone says it. But there's a new statistic out, and it goes way, way further. And what it says is they were qualifying born-again as somebody who once made a decision one prayer one day, no matter how they're living their life now, it didn't matter. They said some prayer one time, and that's why they're considering those people born again. And guess what? They have virtually the same uh, divorce rate statistic. However, another research group came along and said, but that's not born again. Born again are people who live for the glory of God. Born again are people who would who don't forsake the gathering. Born again people are people who, who are in fellowship, who are in the word. Born again people are people following Jesus. Would you guys agree? Now in that group, radically different statistic. Why? Because there's power in the real thing and there's no power in the surface thing. Does that make sense? And that's what this message is about. This message is not... Um, a message to, to, to shake us in the wrong way. This is a message to shake us to say, I want the real thing, God. I want the fullness of your kingdom. I want what you have to offer. What do I got to do? What's my response to that? And who he is determines who we are. And when we realize that he's God Almighty, the sovereign, powerful creator, who, who's the author and perfecter of our faith, the only proper response is say, well, then let me die and let me live through you. Does that make sense? That's, the pro- that's where life begins. Um, some are trying, the passage says, gain the whole world, yet they lose their soul. And that's because the world promises stuff that it simply can't fulfill. Again, this is not a message on saying don't have nice things. The Bible says enjoy the fruit of your labor. Nothing wrong with that, but we've got to consecrate stuff. But some are chasing the world and everything it has to offer, and, and they don't realize eventually they do, that it can't fulfill. Solomon is a guy who did the same thing. Solomon was the richest guy. He had everything. He had vineyards. He had everything. And although he followed God early on, he drifted in his later years. If you read the story of Solomon's life, he went off the deep end. He started pursuing 
desires and everything else. And later on at the end of his life, he came back to some profound statements. And he said, you know, everything I did, that was chasing after the wind. Um, let me read a few of these real quick. They're in your bulletin. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Uh, Ecclesiastes says, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. Uh, all man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. Ecclesiastes 5 says, whoever loves money never has enough money, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. It goes on to say, as goods increase, I love this one, as goods increase, so do those who consume it. In other words, this is Solomon writing this stuff after having everything that he can dream of. And he said, I realized the same thing that Rockefeller realized, that the more I get, the more my appetite grows with it. Does that make sense? So even though I get more, I find out that I just really want more. And even though I get more, I want more. And at the end of his life, he finally realized, you know what? That was chasing after the wind. Um, if I had it my way, every CEO in America, a prerequisite, a requirement for the job would be to read the book of Ecclesiastes only because they will consecrate their decisions and they will consecrate their wealth and they'll be aiming better at what success really is. Does that make sense? Rather than doing what Solomon did, his whole life was this pursuit and at the end he's like, wow, that was a waste of time. Does that make sense? Save, saves a lot of time. This is saying the more we gain, the more our appetite grows. Another passage I want to look at real quick here. This is revealing as well. Luke chapter 12 says this. Uh, you guys can turn there if you have your Bibles. Luke chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 15. And he talks about this attitude of how we see ourself compared to God, how we are consumed by self or is God first. And it, it's a really clear snapshot on a person who is ruled by the giant of self. Instead of having victory over it, they are ruled by it. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 15 begins, Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will st store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Again, this rich man's problem was not his wealth. There's plenty of wealthy people in the Bible. God doesn't have a statement or an issue against wealth unless it's ill-gotten gain. Other than that, wealth is fine. It's just really the issue of his attitude that he had right here. Consumed by self, he was a victim to the giant of self. He said, my crops, my grain, my goods, my barns, my stuff, and I'll say to myself. And God's going, seriously? Seriously? My goods, my grains, my crops, my barns, my stuff. And he was not rich in his relationship with God. <clears throat> I'd say that's one of the biggest evidences is of whether we're ruled by the giant of self or that we've died to ourself. One of the biggest evidences in our life is if we're rich towards our relationship with God. The apostle James said, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. He said, faith without works is dead. And the reason he said this, he probably heard a lot of people talk about their faith, but no evidence for it. That, you know, that the kingdom wasn't changing around them because people weren't putting their faith in action. And faith without works is dead, and it's a reality that, that what we do with what we have is very a clear snapshot of really our heart condition. This guy in the story, my crops, my grain, my goods, my barn, my stuff, and I'll say to myself. It's been said that wealth can be a window through which we see God or a mirror in which we only see ourselves. Uh, wealth can be a window through which we see God. In other words, God, thank you. This is all a blessing. It's all from you. That's a great way to see God through wealth. But some see it as a mirror only to see themselves. 
Um, the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of it is. And I got to say that because money is not. I mean, there are so many great stories. If we had time, we'd get into them. Story of Welch's grape juice. Guy became a multi, multi-millionaire. You know what his intention was? His intention was simply early on, God, I want people to be able to have communion in, in, a, in, a, in a worship service, but some people have a problem with wine. Some people do. Others don't, but others do. And I would hope that they could have unfermented wine so that the ones who don't have a problem, it doesn't stumble anybody else. That was his motive. His only motive wasn't to go out and get rich. God blessed him abundantly. And if you read the story of the origins of, of Welch's grape juice, the guy lived for God's glory and he was very rich in his relationship to God. God had no problem with his wealth, but he knew what to do with it. Another great story is Quaker, Quaker Oats. Started with someone saying, Lord, this guy saw an old broken down mill uh, that needed an awful lot of work and it seemed like a long shot and almost an impossible dream. And he said, Lord, if you let me be successful with this, I want to just give it all back to you. Now, a lot of us say, that sounds like a good idea. I would do that too. But many don't do that. God blessed him and he turned around and he gave away basically everything that, they, I mean, the guy was wealthy, but he gave away all these sorts of things because God's like, I don't have a problem with wealth. Do you understand that? God doesn't have a problem with wealth. He doesn't have a problem with success. God is for you, not against you. That's not what this message is. Please don't misunderstand. God wants to get behind you, but it's the heart condition of these things that matter. And so um, that's why the Bible tells us we can't serve God and money because we'll be loyal to one and the other, but which one do we love? Have we died? Are we alive and well? Is it self and God bless my stuff? Or is it God, you are first, let me live for your glory? It's a complete contradiction of everything the world will tell you all week long, and yet it's a key to the kingdom of God that you and I can live in, in God's power. This is an identity check to be rich towards God. And I would say, if you, if you want to be rich towards God, and this is a self-check, you know, they have places where they check your identity, they check your ID, some places where you vote, they check your ID. This identity check is between you and God. But here's a, here's a good way to know that if you're rich towards God, if you, if you have self in the right place and God in the right self, I think this is a good indicator. Um, the Bible talks about our first fruits with the Lord, and I would say regarding your time and your talent and your treasure, those three things, time and talent and treasure, is God first? Is God first in your life? Or is he not? And that's between you and God. That's not between anybody else. That's not a critique of anyone else. That's between you, your heart condition, and the Lord. But the Bible tells us where our treasure is, our heart will be also. And God is more concerned about our heart than anything. God loves us. He's in mad pursuit of us, but it's our heart condition. Where our treasure is, that's the second note this morning, if you're a note taker, is simply that. Where my treasure is, my heart will be also. It's very true. You can't separate where our heart is and where we invest our time. If you love your kids, you spend time there. If you love your job, you spend time there. If you love it, whatever, wherever our heart is, that's where our pursuit and our time and our investment is. That's a reality. It's a fact of life. It's also a spiritual fact of life. Where our treasure is, our heart will be also. In Luke 12, he says, but do not set your heart on what you eat and what you drink. Don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things and your father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, God knows your heart. He knows what you need. He knows all that stuff. It's saying that if we seek his kingdom first, if we put God in his kingdom, if we say, God, don't just bless my, my stuff, there's a day that I died, and you are Lord, and I am not, and I died, and from now on, I want to live for your glory. When you, when you do that, when you seek him first, all these things will be given to us as well, and the third point this morning is exactly that, that if I am God's, if I died and if I am God's, in other words, God, don't just bless my stuff, my stuff, I'm not my own, I am yours now. It's an identity issue, I died, I'm yours, God, I'm living for your glory. If I am God's, then my problems become God's problems. And how many of you know God's way better at cracking the code on some of this stuff than we'll ever be? That's the point. See, if we're still pursuing the world and trying to pursue God in this awkward place, 
Do all of our problems really need to be God's problems? No, because our life is still our own. But when our life is his, when he's Lord, when we've died, and again, it's, I know this is a shocking, some of you are like, well, this is really tough. I'm not really digging this message. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sharing this message so that make everybody happy. I am sharing this message so it will make you liberated and powerful, though, um, so that you can walk as a citizen of the Most High God in the power that the early church did, the people who understood this and got it. There's no other way around it. Does not read a quick fix book and ask God, say this magic prayer and you get in on these things of the kingdom. Here is where it is, putting God here, saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to live for you and through you. Bingo. God's like, that is a heart I can use. That is a life I can move through. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to finish this life on this earth looking back with regret or going, yeah, I wonder what it would have been like. I mean, wouldn't that be the biggest bummer? Looking back and go, I wonder what it would have been like if I stepped out in faith, if I was used for the glory of God. I don't want to look back that way. Um, Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We touched on that a little bit last week, but the reality is if we find our delight in him, he knows these desires better than we do. And that's why a guy like Solomon, who was super smart, still chased all the wrong things in his own understanding and at the end of his life, after having all this stuff, went, what a waste of time. There are many who do the same thing. Why? Because we don't really know our true heart's desires. We think we do. But we don't know the deepest driving realities of our heart. We don't. But God, your creator and your loving father, does know them. And he's the only one who can give us uh, the deeper things that we will uh, find to fulfill these desires. So the fourth point this morning is really this, to pray Pray to discern the things that cannot satisfy. Pray to discern what they are. There are things that can satisfy, that God wants to satisfy, and they bring profound joy and satisfaction to your life and mine. But there are other things that simply cannot satisfy. Again, Solomon ch chased things his whole life. And at the end, finally went, guess what? <laughs> it doesn't satisfy. And God wants you to be satisfied. He wants us to find our satisfaction in him, but he will give these desires of our heart. Um, and, and again, I, I say this because I, almost prophetically, I believe that if Jesus were to write to the churches today like he did in Revelation, he wrote to the seven churches in Revelation, and each of the churches had their own different thing going on. They owned their own different issue going on. Some things were good, other things were not good. He wrote to the, the churches and goes, here's a... Here's the state of your union, if you will, with me. And here's the state of your heart. And here's the state of the kingdom in your, in your church. I believe in America, honestly, um, the issue that we have in America, Christianity in America, is narcissism. It's about me, myself, and I, oftentimes. Some have referred to that as the unholy trinity. Me, myself, and I. And although we have a faith, that's still over, it's in our culture, it's all around us, it kind of overflows into our lives. And we start navigating our life with me, myself, and I. And that is this narcissism that we have to deal with. I believe if Jesus were to write to the churches today, instead of writing to the church of Ephesus, it would be like the church of Narcissus. You know, I really do. In America, you know, because we're so consumed with stuff. And so the Bible says in the end time, 2 Timothy, that people, listen to this, will be a lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And I think, to be honest with you, there's a sincerity in our hearts that we do love God. But I also think that in America, oftentimes, the loving of pleasure and the pursuits of chasing the things, like Jesus said, that, uh, that the, the pagans, that the non-believers run after, that isn't so different inside the church as it is out of the church. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to get in on the fullness of what God has. I believe you do as well. I believe that's why we're here. I believe we're here because we realize God is doing a bigger thing, not only in our lives, but in this city. I want us to get in on it fully. And as the worship team comes up, I want to close in prayer, but I want to encourage you to do a bold thing. I know in my life, self creeps up. And self, you have to kick off, get off of me, you know? And self, self, selfish desires and selfish things start rising to the top. And I know there was a day in my life, maybe today needs to be the day for some of you, we're going to come forward and take a knee up here before the Lord. This is doing business with God, and we're going to just kneel before God and, and have your own little prayer time and say, God, maybe I haven't died, maybe today is the day officially 
spiritually speaking, on my tombstone, I need to put, this is the day I died right now. I want to live for you. I, I like you. I follow you. I believe, but I never actually died. Maybe today's the day, or maybe you realize, you know what? Self keeps creeping up and getting back on that throne and trying to take over again when God's like, I can't lead you that way. Would you let me lead you? So we're going to close in prayer. I want to encourage you to come up and take a knee uh, up here and do business with God if he's, if he's stirring your heart to do so. I know he is for me. Uh, but mighty God, we just want to close out. And you, you tell us, Lord, you told uh, Jonah said, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And Lord, we don't want to cling to anything that's not you. And we don't want to forfeit anything, uh, any grace that you have for us, God. We want to get in on the fullness of it, Lord. And we want to, Lord, be able to like, Paul was able to say, I'm not my own, I've been bought with a price. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. That's a, that's a huge statement. I think we want to say that, but it's hard to do, God. Would you help us? Would you empower us by your spirit that we would step down and we would put you on the throne, God? That we would, Lord, let you lead our lives, really. That we'd be consumed by you instead of consumed by the world, Lord God. Lord, we want to live in a way that makes you smile. We want to walk in the fullness of your power, of your grace. We want to walk like the early church walked, God. And I believe we're not going to have that. We're not going to have that if we got one eye on the world and all those desires and the selfish things driving us at the same time we try to honor you. It's a contradiction. Lord, can there be some breakthrough in our lives today? Let, it, let there be breakthrough, Lord. I know for me, let it begin with me, God. I want to just confess that to you right now, God. When self rears up in my life, Lord God, and I start chasing those, it's a contradiction of your calling in the kingdom. And I confess that to you. And I confess that to everybody here. God, deliver me from self. Lord, let me not be a, uh, succumbed by the, the giant of self, Lord God. Let us live for your glory today, Lord God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit valleymetrochurch.com.